This is Matthew Cratter from Trade University, and today I want to answer two questions. Is Bitcoin too volatile, and is Bitcoin a bad inflation hedge? These are very, very common questions that I get on this channel, and the typical comment goes something like this. Look how high CPI, CPI inflation has been for the past year or so, and Bitcoin has gone nowhere since December of 2020. Therefore, Bitcoin is a bad store of value. It's also really volatile which makes it even worse. Now, this is true that we're back to, call it December of 2020. Bitcoin price is trading currently at about 29,000, almost, almost 30,000. This is also an argument that, surprisingly, the Fed has been making on their blog, on the FRED website, which is, which is put out by the Federal Reserve, which is a central bank in the US. They have a blog post from just a, a day or so ago called Buying Eggs with Bitcoin, in which they try to dunk on Bitcoin and show that it's too volatile to use to buy your groceries with. This itself is, is quite amazing. If we take a look at the price of eggs in priced in US dollars from the Fred from the Fed's own website, from the Fred website, we can see that even the US dollar, even pricing eggs in the US dollar, eggs are very volatile as well. So this is a strange kind of argument to be making. What the, what the Fed does, though, in this blog post is they take a look at the price of Bitcoin. I'm sorry, they take a look at the price of eggs as priced in Bitcoin to show that it moves all over the place and that in this way, uh, Bitcoin is not a good store value or medium of exchange. So this is the actual chart they're using. They make it, make it available. And we can see here over the time period that they're using, I think they start on the blog post roughly uh, beginning of, of 2021, that eggs have appreciated slightly against Bitcoin. And this is the argument they make. The surprising thing, though, is if you scroll out, their, complete, their argument completely falls apart. They choose, they cherry pick their time frame very closely. So if we scroll out to five years, we can see that the price of eggs in Bitcoin just get, keeps getting cheaper and cheaper all the time. It is volatile just as it is volatile in US dollars. But the nice thing is that eggs, if you're a Bitcoiner, keep getting cheaper. If we if we look at the 10-year chart, it's almost like eggs have gone uh, from being priced in something to being priced uh, completely free. Now, this is true if we look at all the basic commodities. We can look at wheat, which has doubled or so over the past couple of years, also extremely volatile, priced in US dollars. But when we price it in Bitcoin, which is what you do if you value your wealth in Bitcoin, and if you're beginning to think in terms of Bitcoin as a unit of account, we can see that the price of wheat has gone down in Bitcoin terms. So when this chart goes down, that means Bitcoin is strengthening relative to wheat. When it goes up, it means wheat is strengthening relative to Bitcoin. So wheat has appreciated in Bitcoin terms. It's outperformed Bitcoin for uh, since the beginning of 2021. But when we scroll out, we see the same thing that we saw with eggs, where wheat just keeps getting cheaper and cheaper for Bitcoiners. If you're finding this video helpful so far, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Maybe share this video with a few friends as well who are worried about Bitcoin as not being a good store of value or being too volatile. We can do the same thing. We can apply the Fed's same critique to gasoline. Look how look how volatile uh, gasoline is priced in dollars. There, uh, therefore, U.S. dollars aren't a very good currency. Of course, this is a ridiculous argument to make because when you have free markets, which we don't really have, but if you had free markets, you would expect volatility as supply and demand interact and create a clearing price. But even priced in U.S. dollars, gas is quite volatile. This is petrol or gasoline, not natural gas. If we price it in Bitcoin, as we've been doing, we can see that the price of gas for Bitcoiners just keeps going down over time. Gas keeps getting cheaper and cheaper. If we look at the price of housing in US dollars, the pri price of housing went down quite sharply during the great financial crisis. We had drawdowns of 50% or more in parts of the country. Even California saw 50% drawdowns. So the price of housing is also volatile in US dollars. When we look at it priced in Bitcoin though, we can see that housing just keeps getting cheaper and cheaper for Bitcoiners. If you've been a Bitcoiner for a period of time, you uh, houses just become more and more in reach and you haven't even noticed, if you're storing your wealth in Bitcoin, you haven't even noticed prices moving up over the past over the past few years. And this is a general rule. I could go through and do this with all the different commodities on the FRED website. When you're a Bitcoiner, everything around you keeps getting cheaper. It may not keep getting cheaper over six months or 12 months or so, 
but if you're valuing your wealth in Bitcoin, if you're using it as a store of value, and when you're measuring things as a store of value, you have to look at multi-year periods. It's ridiculous. There is no asset in the world that holds its value over short periods of time. I suppose the US dollar holds its value over very, very short periods of time, uh, but this doesn't do you any good when it's, when it's losing its purchasing power by 8 or 10% a year. So all stores of value, housing, real estate, gold, um, stocks, are volatile over time. But if you're a Bitcoiner and using it as a store of value, as a medium of exchange, and as a unit of account, everything around you keeps getting cheaper over time. And this is a really good feeling to have. I've only been a Bitcoiner in terms of a hodler since 2019, but even over this very short time period, it's amazing to see how Bitcoin preserves your wealth and increases your wealth. And this is very different from being a fiat person where you're holding euros or dollars, US dollars or yen. When you're in the fiat financial system, it feels like you're always swimming upstream. You work really hard hours, you get a huge portion of your earnings confiscated in the form of taxes that's then completely wasted on bureaucracies and dropping bombs on women and children. And then the Fed takes that money that's in your savings account and it makes it lose its value over time. They run the money printers, and so the cash you're holding in your savings account, which is about as safe as it gets, especially if you have FDIC insurance as we have in the US, you're still losing your purchasing power anywhere from five, six, seven, eight, up to 20, 25%, depending on what your personal inflation rate looks like. So this is the difference between the, difference between the fiat financial system and the Bitcoin system. In this way, the Fed and the U.S. Treasury should not be criticizing anyone simply because goods and services priced in U.S. dollars have still been very volatile. Gas prices have been incredibly volatile over the past couple of years. Crude oil prices actually went negative in the front of the futures curve. Wheat, eggs, everything has been extremely volatile. And, and to add insult to injury, or to add injury to insult, the U.S. dollar has also been a terrible store of value over any time period that you measure it. So here's this chart that I've, I've shared a number of times. The Federal Reserve, the US Central Bank, was founded in 1913, and this chart is indexed to $1 being worth $1 worth of purchasing power in 1913. As of 2013, a US dollar, $1 purchased about five cents. Uh, so it's, it's basically went down 95% in terms of its purchasing power, which is what you what you rely on if you're if you're saving for retirement or if you're storing your wealth in a fiat currency, this was 2013. We're probably down to two or three cents in 2022. So the US dollar is volatile against goods and services. It's also a terrible, terrible store of value. So we can see that the Fred blog really cherry picked their data when they're talking about the volatility of eggs. If you're a Bitcoiner, you never have to worry about the price of eggs. And if you're a Bitcoiner, you probably own some chickens too because you understand the, the value of decentralized food sources. I think it's interesting though, the very fact that the Fed feels the need to write a blog post like this shows that we are winning. We have this weird little software program called Bitcoin. It's taken over the world and even the Fed feels obliged to write a blog post about it and try to make fun of it. They do it in a very stupid way. They cherry pick their time period. And when you scroll out, you see that Bitcoin is actually uh, not that volatile in terms of being able to buy eggs. And all the volatility actually goes to the upside. Your eggs become cheaper and cheaper, just like your gas and your housing and your wheat. It's also interesting to note here that the Fed did not attack Ethereum or Solana or any other crypto. This is because Bitcoin is the real enemy. There's no other alternative. All of these centralized currencies, centralized cryptos, do are not a real threat to governments or to central banks. Only Bitcoin is. Bitcoin has the largest brand in the world. It has the greatest liquidity. It has the largest network effects. And it is a formidable opponent to central banks. That's why they didn't write an article pricing their eggs in Ethereum. As we said, Bitcoin is volatile, but most of the volatility is to the upside. And I like this meme, Bitcoin's too volatile, we're, we're drowning in volatility. And then you realize that the returns, they're probably not quite this high anymore since the, since the beginning, but they're probably certainly above 100% compounded annual growth rate. And so the, the volatility, a lot of the volatility is really to the upside, not to the downside. And we can see this if we want to know whether, if we want to answer the question whether Bitcoin has been 
a good inflation hedge, in other words, a good store of value since uh, since 2017, we can compare it to CPI prices. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume here that you had the worst timing in the world and you bought all your Bitcoin at the peak in December of 2017. You bought it right at the top tick and you held it to the present. Even with that terrible timing, did you do better than the CPI? In other words, did Bitcoin appreciate enough to keep up or exceed the, the rate of inflation? So this is a chart of the CPI from December, essentially December of 2017 to April, uh, April, uh, the beginning of April. This is the, the latest CPI numbers we have. And if we look at it over this period, this, this CPI index, which is of course put out by the Fed, is up 16%. So in other words, we've had the US dollar uh, lose purchasing power about 16%. Again, this really understates the reality. But this is since I'm measuring again, I'm measuring this from the peak of Bitcoin in the last cycle in December of 2017. Over that same period, even if you had had terrible timing and you had bought Bitcoin, you, had, you hadn't dollar cost averaged in, you bought all of it right at the peak, your Bitcoin is still up 54%. So even if this the actual rate of inflation is 25, 30, 40%, you've still outperformed inflation. In other words, you preserved your purchasing power and Bitcoin has been a fantastic store of value and inflation hedge, even assuming you had terrible timing and bought at the peak of the previous uh, of the previous cycle. If we take a look at gold versus Bitcoin over this period, gold is this orange uh, this orange line. Bitcoin is the blue line. So even from the peak of Bitcoin, Bitcoin is up. Uh, the peak of Bitcoin in December 2017, Bitcoin is up approximately 54%. Gold is up 44%. So Bitcoin, even if you FOMO'd in right at the top, you've still outperformed gold. Obviously, if we scroll out, this uh, the divergence between gold and Bitcoin just becomes enormous. And this is why people like Peter Schiff are so uh, are so bitter. Gold since call it since uh, December of 2014 is up 100 and uh, is up 50%. And Bitcoin is up seven uh, seven thousand eight hundred and twenty percent since then. If you want to measure your uh, returns in Bitcoin and its increase in purchasing power, another way of doing it, rather than assuming the worst and assuming you bought it all at a cyclical peak, let's assume that we started cost averaging, dollar cost averaging, right at that peak in December. Uh, the peak was on December seventeenth, twenty seventeen. Let's say that we bought ten dollars every week since then, uh, up to the present. You can. This is a great. Uh, I'll link to this below. But you can you can decide whether you bought it weekly, biweekly, monthly, etc. We can see that if you dollar cost averaged and you put uh, ten dollars into Bitcoin every single week over that time period, over that dollar cost averaging, you spend two thousand three hundred forty dollars in today's. Uh, value that's currently worth six thousand eight hundred ninety dollars. So your return on investment is very close to uh, what we were talking about, one hundred nine hundred ninety five percent Kager compound annual growth rate. So we can see here how dollar cost averaging, even if inflation were fifty or one hundred percent, we're still massively outperforming that with Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is actually a very good inflation hedge. You'll have people measure it as an inflation hedge over a couple of weeks or a few months or even a year. This is not the proper time period and people usually cherry pick uh, these, these time periods in order to make Bitcoin look bad. You can't measure the performance of any asset over a very short period of time. It's a meaningless, uh, it's a meaningless statistic, especially when you're talking about inflation hedges and uh, maintaining your purchasing power, you have to compare assets over longer time periods because there's a lot of noise in the short term. But I hope you see what I've done here is I've, I've made the worst assumptions in terms of the uh, the most pessimistic assumptions, assuming that even if you buy, even if you bought Bitcoin at 69,000 a year or so ago, you're probably still going to be fine as this, as this shows. You just have to have that strength to hodl. You have to understand that Bitcoin continues to take market share, its adoption rate continues to grow. And this is one reason we have central banks attacking it. And this is really amazing that this small, modest computer program is taking over the world and now merits attacks from the Federal Reserve. And uh, we can see how hollow their attacks are. They can't even do better than that. 
If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.